Hi, I'm Jim Simivan, and welcome to Episode 9 of TTS Talks. We are very happy to be back, and we hope this discussion will be both enlightening and illuminating. TTS Talks is a podcast where we take a deep dive into the complexities of our mission here at To The Stars by bringing you one-on-one -on -one conversations with the various people who are helping us achieve our goals and give life to our projects here at To The Stars. I'm Jim Simivan, co-founder of TTS and vice president of operations. As many of you already know, I was a career officer at the Central Intelligence Agency for 25 years, and I've been a consultant for the CIA and the intelligence community since my retirement in 2007. I have had a strong interest in and have been a student of what we call the phenomenon for over 45 years. And today, I am very pleased to announce that Peter Lavenda will join me for part one of what will be a three-part series discussing secret machines, gods, man, and war, our trilogy of nonfiction books, which Peter co-authored with Tom DeLonge. Peter is a well-known author and historian who is highly regarded for his extensive research and knowledge of occultism and occult history. He has an MA in both religious studies and um, uh, Asian studies from Florida International University, and he speaks a variety of languages, uh, some of them even dead. Uh, he's penned many unpublished, many, <laughs> excuse me, spent many published works on esoteric subjects and is best known for his book on Holy Alliance, a history of Nazi involvement with the occult, uh, which is just simply excellent. And, and the trilogy Sinister Forces, a grimoire of American political witchcraft. Sinister Forces, by the way, is an excellent and compelling trilogy on what Peter Apley refers to as American political witchcraft. It is a must read. It's one of my favorite trilogies. Peter's also appeared on uh, numerous television programs on the History and Discovery channels as an expert on Nazi Germany, especially the extreme religious and esoteric ideas that form the Nazi worldview. Peter, thank you so much for being here today. And uh, I wonder if you can begin with a brief inter overview of the Secret Machines trilogy, Gods, Man, and War. How did you and Tom come up with that, uh, that idea? And uh, how much time did you spend chatting with Tom about where you wanted to go? And were you both comfortable about what you wanted to be doing with it? Yeah, when, when Tom, uh, and thanks for the introduction, by the way, sure. um, and your very kind words. Um, Tom's um, vision was really was really energetic. When he first approached me, um, he had a very clear idea of what he wanted, and it was extremely ambitious. And so we needed to do more than what the UFO community was comfortable with up to that point. Like, it was okay to write books about UFOs and to try to um, explain UFOs or to give all the evidence in support of a belief in flying saucers or aliens or something like that. Tom didn't want to stop there. He didn't want to even start there. What he wanted to do was, in the first place, go to the people who we assume knew more than we did about this subject. So go to the government, go to the military, go to the intelligence community, go to industry, uh, go to academia, and ask people politely, you know, can you tell us more? I mean, what can you tell us? And to do it in a non-threatening, non-adversarial way. What basically he didn't want to do was run into the Pentagon, you know, yelling, Roswell, Roswell, like, like right. Al Pacino in you know, Dog Day Afternoon, Attica, right. Attica. Attica. Right. Yeah, we didn't want to do that. Okay, we wanted to say, okay, guys, let's let's calm down, you know, let, let's, let's address this somehow. But his, his idea of the project was a combination of fiction and nonfiction. He had a reason for that. And the reason was that if we did just a fiction book on UFOs, it's another fiction, I mean, another nonfiction book, rather. If we just did another standard volume on UFOs, it would go up on the shelf with all the other volumes. And it may convince some people and it may not. Uh, we wanted new information, which is why, you know, we went all over the place. Uh, to Washington, to the West Coast, to, to all kinds of different individuals interviewing people and talking to people. So we wanted a new perspective. But at the same time, if it was only a fiction, a nonfiction book, um, it had the danger of being, uh, of falling into a little crack by itself. You know, people would, people who were already believers would read it. Uh, people who were not believers would ignore it. 
Plus, there's a whole other demographic of young people growing up with technology that we didn't have or I didn't have in, in my childhood. Uh, so you have the internet, you have personal computers, you have smartphones and all the rest of it. So you're you're used to a free flow of information and immediate gratification that way. If we were going to do nonfiction on UFOs and it was going to be really in depth, we're going to lose a huge chunk of that demographic. So the idea was let's let's do a two pronged approach. Let's have nonfiction and fiction simultaneously. Right. Let's try to provide a narrative. You know, when you go to, to if you're in high school and you're studying history, uh, you're memorizing names, dates, and places. Uh, it's data. You're being deluged with data. This happened because there's only a short period of time in which to cover all of American history, let's say. So you have one class, you know, one semester, and you're going to learn all of American history in that semester. Well, that's stupid. It's impossible. But if you provide a narrative, if you contextualize the data, you provide some kind of way of organizing the material in a, in a meaningful way, you're going to remember what you've learned. You're also going to become engaged uh, psychologically, emotionally, mentally in the information. It's not going to be a bunch of stuff in a dusty book sitting on a shelf. It's going to have immediacy. And I think that's what he was attempting to do by combining fiction and nonfiction. He wanted the nonfiction uh, uh, structure in order to give the framework to what was going on to show that we weren't making stuff up. It had to be things that we could rely upon as data, what people were telling us, uh, his contacts in, in government and places like that. And then we're going to blend that in with a fictional narrative to try to make people understand the implications of the data. And I think that's what we, what we intended to do. And I think we kind of succeeded in doing that, from for at least from my perspective. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Let me ask you, why why the term you know gods man and war why why gods did you why did you begin with gods how did you proceed to man and you know and the interesting one is war i mean i i, I yeah i mean i i've read all three drafts so i i'm very familiar with it and uh but nevertheless if you could explain that yeah actually it didn't start out that way <clears throat> the uh, the trilogy started it was just going to be three books uh it hadn't it, themes had not been developed and I went to work immediately, and I basically wrote most of Volume 3, War, before I wrote the other two. Uh, and I was writing all this other stuff, and then Tom one day out of the clear blue sky, months down the line, I mean, I've got hundreds and hundreds of pages written. And then Tom calls me and says, I have this idea. Let's divide it into gods, man, and war. And I'm thinking, oh, crap. <laughs> now I've got to go and take out the God <laughs> stuff and put it here and the man stuff and put it here and the war stuff. I had a narrative that was more or less chronological and now right. we're breaking it up into themes, right? So that happened later. I mean, but of course, obviously before the first book came out. But I had already written a good over half of, of the trilogy by that time. So I had to go back and break it up. But it made kind of sense because there are three major themes in this. One is the religious theme. The consciousness right. thing. The second is the science, you know, concept, all the science that's involved with the study of the UAPs. But then there's the war thing, which is really overriding everything else, because why do we not know more about UAPs? Why has not the government, any government really, come out and said, this is what the UAP is, this is what we know? They don't do that because of national security concerns. Basically, that's where we were always told. There's a national security component to this. So um, war then became a real fixation. Okay, what does that really mean? How, how do we handle this then? What do we do? You know, it's not just the United States that has a monopoly on UAP sightings, right? The Soviet Union in the old days did. Uh, Russia still does. China does. Uh, the three major countries. Then we also have Brazil. We have France, Italy. Everybody has their own division dealing with this in one way or another. And there's always a national security implication to it. So it made sense to break it up that way. And so I went back and started, you know, and gods became gods, you know. And then um, man then became expanded even because I said, well, I have room now. I can do right. 
quantum mechanics and I can do biology, anthropology, genetics, and all the rest of it. Let's see. Let's you know really investigate this and take it apart. That's interesting. And and when I when I read the trilogy, uh, one of the things that stuck out uh, and uh, something that like most ufologists and researchers talk about, you can't really talk about UAPs just as UAPs. I mean, it's just so much larger than that. Right. And if you don't bring in the cultural, the social cultural aspects to it, the religious aspects, the scientific aspects all together. Um, uh, and, and, and essentially what the UFO myth or however you want to call it has affecting us as a society. It, um, uh, I think you're, you're, you're missing the big point. Uh, explain to me uh, one more time how you and Tom agreed on cigarette machines with a K. I have explained this before and I, I've forgotten it, but I think for our listeners. Well, it's not that we agreed on it. Uh, Tom said, we're going to spell secret with a K. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and he said, because it's more street, you know, it's got a more youthful feel to it by spelling it with a K. It's almost like graffiti on the side of a building. Yeah. Uh, like you've tagged the building with secret with a K. But to me, it, it actually had dimensions beyond that because it, when you spell a, a very familiar word incorrectly, you know, it, it's multivalent at that point. Secret with a K makes everybody stop and look and think, what the hell does that mean? Why is he spelling it with a K? And that automatically draws you into the into the title and into the subject matter. What's this book about? Why are you spelling it with a K? If we had just used secret machines with a C, you know, the way it's normally spelled, it might be mistaken for a book on the technology behind UFOs, right? The nuts and bolts aspect, right. which is very important, but uh, it, it would... It would reinforce the idea of machine, in a sense, over the secret. By putting the K in there, it makes the secret front and center. It puts the secret first. It makes you ask why, as you just did, why is it secret with the K? What are we trying to, to communicate? And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to give people a pause saying, whoa, whoa, what does this mean? Why are you spelling it with a K? And it draws you into the subject. You realize there's something else going on. It's playful, in a sense. Yeah. There's a librium involved. There's a kind of a game that's being played uh, with the title, and it's deliberate, and it, it does draw you in. Now people see secret machines. They know exactly what it is. If we had spelled it with SEC, people might just put it in a different category and forget about it. But that case that's out there, and it, it, gets, it gets your attention. It does. It really does get your attention. You and Tom, when when you were doing the trilogy, when you were talking about it, I, I was privy to some of the conversations uh, you, you, Tom, stated that this project, I'm quoting here, is designed to inspire nothing less than a cultural revolution in human consciousness. So my question is, what do you mean by cultural revolution in human, con in human consciousness, and do you think it has already begun? Well, Jim, um, yeah. cultural revolution... <laughs> is a term that's kind of loaded for a lot of people. It re, you know, it's, it calls I'm back. I'm thinking now. 1968 China, exactly. right? Yeah, okay. Exactly. Yeah. Little Red Book and all the rest of it. But cultural revolution is still used as a term that means there's an ideological um, a cultural shift. Like we're trying to rearrange people's um, uh, kind of frozen in place way of thinking about things. Ufology uh, can be its own worst enemy. Um, it kind of sets up the stage that this is what ufology is. You're either a believer or you're not. And if you're a believer, you believe everything. And if you're not a believer, you don't believe anything about UFOs. And it, it's this false choice, this false dichotomy. You're either with us or against us. A cultural revolution from our point of view was we're going to restate the problem. We are going to restate the entire approach to the subject. We're not going to be bound by what has been going on traditionally in uh, ufological circles, uh, the little green men and the flying saucers and all the rest of it. We're going to step back from all of this, and we're going to approach this from a completely different perspective. We're not going to be the passive um, uh, witnesses of, of esoteric or UAP phenomena, and we just sit there and record it and shrug our shoulders and say, well, we don't know what this means. We're going to step back and say, there's a lot of data on UFOs already. There's a massive amount, really, that's in the public uh, sphere that's accessible, uh, just that no one's paying attention. And why are they not paying attention? Because there's no cultural context for this. The cultural context is, if you believe in UFOs, you're a psycho. There's something wrong with you. You're gullible. You're, you're credulous. We wanted to reframe all of that. We wanted to take it out of that and put it in, make it mainstream. Tom's thing was, we're going to make this mainstream. This is not going to mm -hmm. be a little niche 
uh, uh, market with a bunch of, you know, already believers, true blood believers who are just going to keep buying the same books over and over again. We're going to re we're going to retool this. And that's the cultural revolution aspect. Intellectually, culturally, uh, we're going to try to make this into something different. We're going to try to get people to understand that this is important to them. Maybe they never watched a science fiction film in their life or they don't know anything about flying saucers or they think it's all crazy stuff. We're going to try to, to reevaluate it and say, look, it's just, this is happening in every part of your lives. This has an effect or it could, if you're not aware of it, have an effect in every area of, of your life. And in order to do that, we have to convince people that they have something to contribute to this story. They have something to contribute to the analysis and the study of this. They don't have to be passive recipients. We're now living in this digitized age where everybody has the ability to start contributing uh, in, in a real way. Right. So I think that's what we meant by a cultural revolution. We're going to change everybody's way of looking at this. It's not going to be in a little box marked UFO. It's going to be something else. It's science. It's religion. It's culture. It's politics. Uh, it's biology. It's anthropology. It's all of these things. And that's, I think, what what we meant. And I think we're 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 achieving that slowly but surely. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think you I think you've done an excellent job with this. Um, when when you read the books, to me, uh, there was so much background information I was not aware of. So when you put it into that uh, historical perspective and cultural perspective, uh, it opened uh, opened my eyes quite a bit. Um, and I'm very very glad you did it. Did, when you and Tom are putting this together. Um, were both of you concerned at all about coming off to the public as being a bit diluted <laughs> or maybe hyperbolic? Well, I've always had I that mean, problem, I mean, seriously, Jim. You, 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 yeah, I've always had <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that, that's, yeah. Uh, well, you know, Tom was secure enough, I think, in his celebrity, if nothing else, that, uh, you know, his background as a rock star was already very controversial in some ways, Right. Uh, and lovable to a lot of fans in another way. So I think he was gonna he was ready for that. For me, uh, the kinds of books that I published in the past before before Tom and I connected was uh, you know were books that people would stop and stare and say, wait a minute, you know what are you trying to say? Nazi occultism, right? Or sinister forces, which has chapters on the UFO phenomenon. So there is this you know um, this this kind of leather skin that we had going into this thing. Uh, that, you know, yeah, maybe people will, will do that because the whole subject has been demonized that way. Our whole goal was to take that on and to turn it around, to flip it and say, no, you know, you don't have to be a psycho uh, to believe in UFOs. It's not a question of belief. It's a question of, well, do you believe in microbes, right? You haven't seen one maybe, but you know they exist, right? And the data on UFOs right. was so overwhelming that our point was we're going to risk being considered gullible or stupid or, you know, uh, 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 tools of the, the deep state or whatever you wanted to, to call it, and just go out there and do it and say, no, you know, this is the reason why we're not deluded. We're not fools. Uh, we're going to go and tell you why this is real. And we're going to get other people with excellent credentials to come out and say, yeah, it is real. This was our focus. So, yeah, they could have considered us, you know, deluded. Because we're only, you know, in UFOs until recently, and I've been to Contact in the Desert and, and, and places like that giving presentations, and it's basically, that's it. You are either a believer or you're the enemy, right? And once you're a believer, you're expected to believe everything. Every story that comes down the pike, you better believe it because if you criticize it, right. you're part of the problem. And our, our approach to this was, no, 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 come on. We're going to make this a credible um area of study, the area of research, but we're not going to pander to government or science or the academia either. We're going to insist, pay attention. There's something here. You've got to pay attention. Um, this general is saying, pay attention. And this guy in the IC is saying, pay attention. This engineer or scientist is. And we're going to come out and say, these people are credible. They come from a good background. Their credentials are obvious. Their reputations are solid. And they're saying, no, you're not crazy. There is something out there. And the funny thing is, there was so much fallout from this blowback, you might say, uh, people in the UFO community saying, oh, my God, this is terrible. What are these people doing? They're, they're rocking the boat here. You know, uh, They're part of the problem. There are all kinds of complaints were, were aimed at us because 
we were actually trying to prove that this was true. In the UFO community in general, I'm not being specific about anyone or anything or any group, but you can sense it when you're out there. You can say almost anything and you're going to get a cadre mm-hmm. of people that's going to believe it. And right. when To the Stars came out and said, yes, there is a UFO phenomenon. There's a UAP phenomenon. The government knows about it and they're going to start talking about it. It was kind of threatening because everybody was kind of comfortable in this fuzzy kind of world where UFOs and saucers and aliens was was anything you wanted it to be. And now here comes authority figures, essentially. And they're coming out and saying, no, it's real. It's really real. And we have some video, by the way. And we have some, you know, interviews with pilots and, and other people who are verifying that this is real. A lot of people in the community thought, well, wait a minute. I thought I was living in this nice, comfortable world where we could, you know, it was like a Tolkien thing or a Renaissance fair. And now suddenly we've got, you know, actual people saying the UFO thing is real. A lot of people embraced it. They said, finally. And I made these presentations at, at uh, Contact in the Desert, you know, saying you don't, you can throw away your tinfoil hats. It's over. Okay. You're not going to be laughed at anymore. This is real. You know, get used to it. And it was greeted with, you know, an embrace on the one hand and, you know, horror on the other. So, yeah, we were we were in danger of being deluded and worse. We were in danger of being considered, you know, evil or, or you know, puppets of, like I say, the deep state or, you know, the IC community or, you know, the intelligence community or something. So we 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 anticipated that. I also told Tom, you know, by the way, um, people are going to look at, you know, AJ and me like we're Yoko Ono, you know, so we have to be careful of that, too. We're breaking up the right. band here, you know. Uh, but of course, that wasn't really what happened. Yeah. But okay. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, when I first met Tom. Um, it's essentially uh, the reason we paid attention to him, or I, I paid attention to him and a few others, was that uh, he he was really coming off as being very yep. serious about this. And he took his uh, a leadership role. And um, I, when I met him, uh, we had dinner one night, and it was very apparent to me after like, 20 minutes into the conversation. This is one serious, serious guy. Um, and he had a serious way of looking about that. And over lunch the next day, we decided we were going to put something together uh, and, um, uh, you know, formed, you know, to the stars uh, with Hal, you know, and there were others that were there too who chose not to do that, which is fine. Um, they had other things going on in their lives at the time. But uh, I was, I was really surprised. Tom never told me his advisor, who his advisors were obviously picked that up from, from uh, the Russian right. email leaks, uh, some of them, uh, a couple of them I guessed, but I was very impressed with who they were. And um, uh, I knew the the two CIA, uh, senior CIA guys uh, that he had met with. I know them, I know them well. Uh, their names will not, won't come out. And Tom's never, ever admitted to me that's who they are, but I, but I know that's who they are, but, but we, we don't talk about it and that's fine. Um but let me, uh, yeah, so I, I, th- I think you're right. I mean, I, I wanted to do Contact in the Desert and a lot of these things. And I was told by John Alexander at one point, he said, look, be careful when you walk in. He said, you know, you, you got to have a really thin skin and a day job, he said, and, and expect to get a lot of criticism. So I decided, oh, I'll hold back. You know, I'm, I'm not ready to do that now. Um, you know, in the prologue um, uh, to uh, God's, uh, you, you stated that this project is not intended to convince you of the reality of UFOs. If you need convincing after all of the data that has been presented, then there is nothing here for you. And I know you, you, you alluded to this a little bit earlier here. Is it even possible to get most ordinary people to accept the reality of UAPs and all that it entails? And what are the roadblocks of this happening? Because it's, it's, it's a big deal. I, I talk to a lot of people and they look at me like I'm, I'm out of my mind. When I, when I bring up this topic and I, sometimes I wonder, is there any way we're ever going to be able to discuss this rationally with people? And because their eyes seem to glaze over a lot. Sure. You know, we're still, we're still faced with that, except for the first time, at least in the last 70 years, um, we're seeing very sober reporting going on about UAPs in the print media, on television, and, you know, interviews and all the rest of it, and to the stars right up there in, in the front of, of promoting this, getting getting a major shift, like I say, cultural revolution is what's kind of required. We have in this country, um, de Tocqueville, you know, back in the day, 200 years ago, 
was saying that religious mania in the United States is very common. You know, be careful. <laughs> and, you know, if you know anybody, as you do, you people in Europe, people in other parts of the world, they say, what's wrong in the United States? There's all these religious things going on. People are very religious. They wear their religion on their sleeve. And that's a cultural uh, environment that the UAP subject is taking place within in this country. There's a lot of religion around it. And there's a lot of religious uh, pushback against it. And yet, you know, George Carlin famously, his, his interview has been, uh, his, uh, his stand-up routine on UFOs is now making the rounds again uh, on the internet. And Carlin said, you know, why is it that if you're interested in UFOs, you're a UFO buff? You know, you, you, you believe in beings from space who come down and, and give things to humans and tell them how to live. But if you're a Christian or belong to any religion, they're not, they don't call you a God buff. <laughs> you know, that you believe in right, being in space right, that right. comes down. And I mean, it's, isn't it the same thing? You know, why is one uh, devalued in, in, in favor of the other? And there is that kind of, uh, of situation here where a lot of people, it's not a scientific um, resistance, I think, to the UFO, UFO UAP phenomenon solely. There's also religious issue here. And um, when I was researching Sinister Forces and then later researching the, the To the Stars, the Secret Machines books, I kept coming across these, these incidents that were mentioned in the press, they would come and go, of a lot of real religious fanaticism, either in the United States government, at the Pentagon, um, for some reason, uh, over at um, uh, the the Air Force Academy, you know, in Colorado Springs, there's like religion is like a major issue over there. I mean, there's like discussions about religion, and there's and there's this That's insistence right. that people go to church every Sunday, and they had presentations on Islam, which were you know, frankly, you know, absurd. All kinds of stuff was going on where religion was concerned. And, you know, there were senators and congressmen who didn't want to fund UFO research or UAP research or even remote viewing research because they thought it was demonic. Um, and you still get that, you know, even today. There's a, a lot of people out there who associate the UFO phenomenon with religious uh, ideas and concepts, and they don't like it, right? They're, they're, they're afraid of it. So I think there's a cultural hurdle that we have to, to cross, not just the one in science. We're getting scientists now starting to talk about this, as you know. You got Avi Loeb very famously, yes, but a lot of other people absolutely. are talking about it. Religious studies scholars are writing books on this. Um, you, you're getting people open-minded, saying we have to take it seriously. We don't still don't understand what it is, but there's radar tracers, there's video, there's eyewitness testimony. It's been going on for years and years and years, and to ignore it constantly is not getting us anywhere. So some people are approaching it from well, maybe it's some weird psychological consciousness phenomenon. Newsflash, yeah, kind of it is. Uh, or maybe it's strictly a scientific you know, thing. Maybe it's uh, secret weapons or something. They're at least asking the questions for the first time. They're going out there and they're saying, what can we learn about this? So the, the impetus is there. You know, We're doing as much as we can at To The Stars to try to promote uh, open dialogue about this and to get everybody involved, no matter what your background, no matter what kind of job you have or don't have, no matter what your religious faith is, or if you don't have any, we're trying to get everybody to participate because everybody has a piece of this of the story. You know, we as a human race, we know what this is. Uh, we do. Individually, we don't. Right? Oh, yeah. And if we could all pool our, our information right. together and really talk to each other about this, we might get somewhere. And I think that's what we're 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 looking to do. We're trying to change the conversation. We're trying to change the culture around this subject. There's no reason why it should be put in a separate box, marked UFO, marked you know demonic this or whatever. Uh, we should be able to get this out in the open and talk about it intelligently, calmly, and rationally and get somewhere. Yeah, that was very well said. I remember when we first uh, started with TTS and and um, and you were obviously way well before me in this. But uh, one of the things with Tom uh, we, we brought up was uh, particularly, you know, Chris, uh, Mellon, and, and Lou, and, and Hal, and, and everybody else involved. We said, we don't want to discuss, you know, whether or not UFOs are real. It's, it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous question. The evidence is overwhelming. We're, we're starting from the premise that it is, and we're not going to argue about it. It is. Now we have to figure out what it is. We don't know that, and we still don't know that. We have some 
pretty interesting clues uh, to what it might be, uh, but we're still not there yet. Uh, I mean, Lou always used to talk about it being somewhere existing between the nexus of, you know, quantum mechanics and uh, consciousness, which is, uh, you know, of two very large, you know, subject areas, mm -hmm. which uh, we don't understand either. So. Uh, 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 so I'm, I'm glad we, we, we took that tack and, and, uh, there were numerous times when people approached us and, you know, particularly, uh, a lot of s skeptics with a capital S, you know, they wanted to get into a, into an argument about this. And once you've seen the data and particularly the classified data, there's absolutely no way you can deny that this is going on. So, um, uh, you know, I had a, another question here about, um, you know, about, um, uh, the secret machines project is offering an, an alternative approach sort of a 21st century reboot of ideas surrounding this phenomenon. And I think you sort of addressed that already. Uh, but do you think you were successful in, in, in doing that so far? Uh, I mean, my personal opinion is you have been. And and I think if people who read your books, you know, Secret Machines, Gods, Man, and War, I think you make an outstanding case uh, uh, for, uh, you know, uh, putting out a new uh, perspective and creating a new paradigm. For discussion well, we wanted to. I mean, that was what we really intended to do from the very beginning, was to not do another UFO book or a series of books. We wanted to go and, and do something new, do something um, that would change, challenge the old paradigms. I mean, that's what you know we wanted to do. Now, I don't know if yeah. we, as to the stars, is you know we're obviously not solely responsible. A whole bunch of different events all happened around the same time. Uh, the famous New York Times articles and right. all of this was happening at the same time as To the Stars was coming out. And, and of course, there was the famous, uh, you mentioned the Russian, you know, uh, email leaks, which actually reinforced the idea that Tom was actually onto something, right? Because everybody was saying about Tom, Tom is just nonsense. He's, yeah. he's, you know, he's making up stories and all the rest of it. And then suddenly, bang, there's all these names coming. Oh, my God, Tom is actually talking to these people. That started making everybody stop and and take a minute, take a breath and say, well, what the hell is going on here? And then the New York Times articles came out and all of this came out all at the same time. Um, and that, I think, helped a great deal to, to, to restart the conversation. I know that the atmosphere, for instance, that contact in the desert changed considerably from before to the stars, before the, the New York Times article and after the New York Times article. Because once the Times article came out, the UFO community got divided into two warring camps, you know, and the whole thing started to get a little nasty and it got very political and conspiratorial, but it got people talking. It got people thinking, maybe they're onto something. Maybe finally we can start doing this. So we challenged, we did our part in challenging the old paradigm. And I think that it just happened at the same time that the Times is doing it. Leslie Keen was doing her job out there and everybody was working on this, on this subject at, the, at around the same time. The, the time was right. Um, the, the, the ground had been, you know, sowed. I mean, we were planting seeds and I think it's, they're starting to grow now. Yeah. You know, one day, Peter, I think you and I are going to have to sit down and talk about, uh, how this all happened, uh, with Tom and TTS, you know, all the players, you all them all, you know, them all very, very well. And, uh, uh, I still sit back and think, my God, you know, when we were in Seattle, when we were announcing the company. I mean, it was just me, Tom, and Hal at the time. And then all of a sudden, Lou, you know, comes on board. And then Chris Mellon comes on board. And then I was shocked one day to see Steve Justice coming on board. And I said, what's happening? I mean, what, how, how is this all coming together? But when you think about it, Tom sure. was really sort of pushing all this from just different angles, from different perspectives. And he was bringing all these people together and uh, sort of, uh, I mean, it's serendipitous. And then, you know, I had met Leslie uh, two before the New York Times article came out and we all had a conversation with her and and then Chris Mellon was instrumental in all of that. Um, so um, it was just interesting how it all came to be very, very quickly with the Russian email leak and everything like that. My God, you know, I don't know whether it was the phenomenon actually orchestrating that or, or what. Let me throw something else out to you. You also stated in God's uh, that the tension between, <laughs> excuse me, authority figures who deny the phenomenon exists and people who actually know this phenomenon exists has led to a dangerous state of affairs, which you call a crisis in confidence that has resulted in a state of inaction. How have things changed in the last uh, uh, few years? I do you think this still exists, or, or do you think we've, we've, we've reached some kind of a tipping point already? I think we've reached a tipping point for sure. 
But the the pressure, the the backlash against it is still very strong. You still get people at DOD who claim we never heard of this, uh, you know, uh, UAP task force. It doesn't exist, and they try to say that Lou didn't exist, and they try to say all these things. And you still got you know pockets of resistance everywhere within Congress and outside of Congress, at the Pentagon, uh, different places pushing back, pushing back. Um, the 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 crisis of confidence is the people who have had these experiences, the the experience of seeing a UFO close encounters, the first, second, third kind, these people know that this exists. And they have a government, not just the government, but a superstructure of government, academia, science, engineering, telling them, no, you're deluded. And you can only hear that so often. That can only go on for so long without creating this crisis of confidence. Suddenly you're thinking to yourself, the government is hiding something. They're being deliberately obtuse about this. Either I'm crazy or the government is lying. And the last thing you're going to think is that you're crazy. Right. So the, the assumption is you're being lied to, you're being manipulated. Obviously, there's a lot more to the story than that. As we mentioned, national security does have play a major role in this. But that can be taken really too far as well. And I think that the Air Force, I don't want to mention any names, <laughs> the Air Force has you know done a Yes, has done most of this damage, you know, because they've, they've they thought to themselves, well, we can screw with people. We can tell them they're not seeing UFOs; they're seeing, you know, secret weapons. Or we can tell them they're seeing secret weapons, and when they're really seeing UFOs, we can turn all this around any way we want to. We're going to, you know, mess with people's minds and do all of this. And you know, there's pe- individuals that we know that have turned it into a cottage industry of saying, yes, I infiltrated the UFO community and I made fools out of them. So, you know, you have that, and that doesn't bolster any confidence. And, you know, I'm old enough to remember Watergate and Iran-Contra and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, the, the, the church committee and the Rockefeller Commission and all the rest of it. So it's like, yeah, okay, we do have a crisis of confidence in general. And if you throw the UFO thing in there, oh my God, it's even worse. But should the government start coming clean about what it knows to the extent that it can about the UAP phenomenon it's going to start, it's going to be a long haul, but it's going to start ameliorating somewhat this, this, this crisis of confidence. If we can begin to, to relax where this is concerned and to understand that, you know, everybody's trying to solve this problem because it is the biggest problem that we face. I know it's a hard thing to say, considering everything going on in the world right now, but the UFO phenomenon goes, strikes to the heart of reality, of our conception of reality, of our political life, um, of our understanding of war, our understanding of politics, our understanding of the, the role of the intelligence community and the role of science and the role of academia. It's right there because this is a phenomenon that is real that we're all ignoring. Everybody's ignoring it. It's the elephant in the room, right? And it's like what we need is the, that famous fable right. of the blind men and the elephant. Right now we have blind men you know, touching the elephant and saying, well, the elephant is a, is a piece of rope or the elephant is like a big fan or the elephant is a tree trunk because they're looking at individual parts. We need a bigger room and we need a lot more blind men in there. We need to put this picture together. And it's really important that we do so as quickly as we possibly can, because it's going to change everything. The way we look at reality, the way we look at each other, the way we look at our planet, it's all there. And I'm not trying to be woke about this. This is just very pragmatic. Everybody has a piece of this puzzle. We've got to put it all together. You know, going back earlier, uh, you made you made a comment about um, you know when Lou, uh, uh, you know, was when the, the Department of Defense was questioning you know, whether Lou actually had this program or not. I I, I remember having to laugh at the time. I I, I was to, um, put together a presentation for a three letter agency. Um, after I joined to the stars and, um, and to get that cleared through CIA, I had to, you know, submit it to them and saying, look, I'm going to this agent, this other sister agency, and I'm going to do this presentation for senior management. And, um, when I was mentioning this to the office of public affairs, you know, uh, a friend of mine came back and they said, well, who the hell do you think they're going to send this to? And I said, what do you mean? They said, think about it. You're, you're talking about UAPs, UFOs, and some other corollary data in there. And they said, who owns it? He said, I don't know any place in CIA that has a you know UFO division or anything like that. He said, there isn't any place. So when you look at that, you have somebody you know, in public affairs or you know, has to look at this material, and they have to decide where it has to go. And if they can't find any place, because there isn't any place, 
So they, they, they come back and they say, yeah, we, I, gee, I guess it's all right. I mean, we don't, we don't care. I mean, we don't know. Lose was the same issue. Lose program was so well, I want to say hidden, uh, it, it, but he had a direct line to the, you know, it was Lou and then a direct line to the uh, uh, USDI and then uh, right to General Mattis and Secretary of Defense. So when the public relations people come on board and they say, we never heard of the program, I, I sort of believe them. Of course, you never heard of the program. When I was still in CIA, I mean, I'd heard there was a guy named Lou and before that, a guy named Jim that was working on this, but I couldn't get anywhere you know, with all this kind of stuff. So the the government itself, I mean, it's we're not, you know, it's 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 all where you go. I mean, John Ramirez, I, I, as my one of my fellow CIA colleagues, talked a lot about this. It's you know all where you go and ask the writing, asking the right questions to whom you know you know who people who that actually will know as opposed to the general, uh, uh, you know, the sort of the general area of CIA or FBI or what have you. But we interviewed Podesta back in 2016, I guess it was, or 2015. 2015, Podesta told us, you know. There's no big box at the Pentagon marked UFO, you know. Uh, we asked him, could the president, like Clinton at the time, could Clinton just say to the to the DOD, give me everything you have on UFOs? Uh, he could say that, and by law they would have to respond, but they had nowhere, they had no way of knowing where that was because it's stovepiped in so many areas. I mean, this little agency over here is studying something which is anomalous, and this people over there, there's no one big group that had all the UFO stuff in one place. So it was, there wasn't one place you could go to, according to Podesta, where you could just say, give us the, give us all, all the things on right. UFOs and they yeah. bring in the box. Right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, didn't another exist. So a quick anecdote, I, when yeah. I gave the pre one presentation, it was very clear to me. There's very, very senior people in the room, a lot of senior scientists. And as the presentation went on, it, it was clear that a few people knew what I was talking about, but others had no clue. Uh, and then I had to back off on some of this stuff that I was going to say because uh, it clear, clearly there were people there that maybe not have been cleared for this, so I had to be careful. But, but interestingly enough, out of all the places that I did brief and all the senior people I talked to, not one said, don't do this. Because one of the purposes of actually doing the briefings was to say, if you've got issues with this, you better tell me what the issues are because we're going, we're not going to discuss classified information, but we are going public with this. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the American people. It belongs to the world population. So you're going to have to basically live with this. But if you tell me, tell me the road, you know, the lanes in the road I can't go into. No, they didn't say anything. They, they basically said to me, fine, go with God, keep us posted. We're fascinated by this. We want to know more about it too. Um, let me jump to another issue real clearly on and early on in God's. Uh, you stated that <laughs> waiting for disclosure from the government is not a wise position to take. Why do you, why do you say that? Just from a, an operational point of view, a very pragmatic point of view, why would you abdicate responsibility this way, right? Why would you sit around and wait for, you know, um, right. the government to disclose what they know? We have so much information already at our fingertips. On top of which, we have the internet. We have got a resource and cell phones, smartphones. We're photographing this stuff now in a way that's never been seen before. We're, we're recording it. Maybe a lot of it is, you know, camera flares and all kinds of other stuff, but some of it's going to be real, right? Out of a hundred, you know, videos that, that people post online, maybe one or two cannot be explained by, you know, normal scientific uh, explanations. Therefore, they deserve greater scrutiny. Right. But now everybody has access to it. In my case, in my own personal case, I had never, ever seen a UFO in my life. When I got involved in this project, never saw one, never had a UFO, specifically a UFO experience. Um, but I, I took it for granted that it was real. And like I say, the preponderance of documentation and, and data meant that it was true. But then I actually had a sighting myself long after Gods and Man was published, right? It's in December a couple of years ago, and I'm coming home in the middle of the night. It's in Florida. And uh, I see lights in the sky, and I think it's a helicopter, police helicopters. We get them sometimes. And I thought, well, you know, that's what it is. But it seemed to stop over my car. I'm thinking, well, uh -oh. yeah, you know, yeah. should I look or should I, should, yeah. do I step run, on the gas or the Peter. brakes? I and mean, what do I do here? <laughs> yeah. Run, exactly, run. 
So I, I just, you know, I rolled down the window and, and I, I looked up in the sky and there were three lights in a triangle shape right over the, and I'm still not thinking UFO. I'm still thinking this is an aircraft of some kind, but it's really weird because it's not making any noise. And helicopters make a hell of a lot of noise. And this was making no noise at all. And as I looked at it, it then took off, you know, without again, any noise and disappeared going in another direction. It was only at that moment that I thought, oh shit, that was a UFO. I finally saw a UFO, but it was happened after it left, right? And I think a lot of people are in that same position. They're thinking, you know, think this last, right. think UFO last, think everything else, every other possible thing first. And so if we're waiting for the government to disclose, why do they have to disclose to me what I just saw? Now, maybe they can say, okay, that was one of our stealth aircraft. It was a secret weapon. We're flying out of, you know, uh, Homestead Air Force Base or something down there. And, okay, I'll, I'll, you know, I can accept that, I suppose, to a certain extent. But that means we have some weapons that are really outstanding because this thing just had no sound, no noise, and disappeared in an instant without any propulsion, anything. There was no nothing, just disappeared. So I'm thinking to myself, well, that's pretty cool anyway, right? But why wait for disclosure? There's so many people who've already had disclosure in their own lives, in their own personal contact, that to wait for the government to approve it, to give the blessing, yes, this was a UFO, okay, that's that's great for your ego, and, and it, it sort of reinforces the feelings that you had and the experience that you had, but is it really necessary? Do we have to wait? And my, my point is disclosure is happening constantly. All that we're really going to get from the government at this point is confirmation, not yes. disclosure. And I think we already have gotten confirmation from the government in a certain respect. I mean, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and the confirmation usually came through Congress with the Gillibrand Amendment and, um, uh, uh, you know, the creation of UAP task forces. I mean, the government just doesn't do that willy nilly. They don't put these things together. Now, we may not get a lot out of that. Uh, uh, frankly, I think there are a lot of people on the task force are, are, are really trying to look for information, more information throughout the government. That's hard to hard to do. Uh, generally, uh, government agencies don't like to share information uh, with one another for all kinds of reasons. There's all different types of security stuff going on there, yeah. so they don't they don't want to do that. Um, but uh, I, you know, I, I, I always get a kick out of when, when people ask me, you know, when, when's the government going to, you know, come out? And I said, the hell did the government need it? I mean, that's why TTS was created in the first place. We weren't going to wait for the government. You know, I told people in the government, we're not waiting for anybody. We're not waiting for you to do anything. This is a public right. issue. It is nothing to do. I mean, it has a lot to do with if you were, you know, military bases and what have you. But by and large, this is happening to normal people, civilians from all around the globe. We own this. I just wish we had a place that was well funded um, uh, that you can actually, you know, uh, throw your information out and talk about it. It doesn't belong in the government. Parts of it do. The national security stuff belong in the government, but really the bulk of it doesn't belong in the government. It belongs someplace else, and I think it's more or less private. Um, let me jump to uh, uh, another question here. I had. Um, as you know, you're a religious scholar uh, and a histori you know, historian, and you spend a good deal of time talking about the religious and historical accounts of alien contact. How far back does alien contact actually go? I mean, do we really see evidence of alien contact at all major religions? And I well, you know, Jacques Vallée came out with a book not too long ago called Wonders right. in the Sky, and he was trying to, to document the earliest UFO sightings or sightings that we today would look at and say, well, that's a UFO sighting or a UAP sighting, uh, going back to ancient Egypt, you know, all the way up to the present. The, the problem with, with discussing this is that you immediately fall into the Eric von Daniken problem or Zechariah Sitchin or ancient aliens. And then, you know, the aliens built the pyramids and that kind of thing. And then you, you start to get caught up in that. And that, again, devalues, and you know, the whole conversation. Now you're now you're off to the races. I felt, and I, th I think that we made this kind of clear in God's, that um, there probably was contact, and it was contact maybe more than 20,000 years ago, an initial contact, which changed the trajectory of, of evolution of Homo sapiens from the hunter-gatherers they were for hundreds of thousands of years, and then suddenly they all start to decide, okay, we're going to build cities and we're going to do all this other stuff. We're going to stop being hunter-gatherers. We're going to be agriculturalists. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. In ancient Sumer, there was this myth that was reported uh, by some of the Greek historians later on that said that a god had come down from the sky, landed in the ocean, 
and then came out wearing a head headdress like a fish and would come out onto land and taught the Sumerians about agriculture, about writing, about all these things. And then he would go back down into the into the ocean to his vessel and he would never eat anything on land. He would never drink anything on land. I mean, it's a very strange story, which makes a lot of sense in a contemporary setting, right? right? Um, you don't want to um, be in a position of getting infected by whatever bacteria is running. If you're a space traveler, you're going to be concerned about that, right? If you're an organic space being, not not a cyborg or an android or something. If you're um, an ancient person and you're making up these stories about agriculture and writing coming from the gods, what does that mean? What is the implication of that? People have a tendency to look at the ancient people and say they're a bunch of superstitious nomads and they don't know what they're talking about and they make up all these stories. Why was it necessary to make up that story? Why, why did we have to say this came from the gods? Maybe it wasn't the gods, quote unquote, but maybe it was something else, someone else, some other group that jumpstarted civilization around the globe all roughly around the same time. Is that what happened? Was something? Did something like that happen? Did it suddenly change everybody's mind and think make us start looking up, looking up into the heavens and start dreaming about things that a hunter-gatherer would not have dreamt of. A hunter-gatherer is thinking about the next meal and staying warm and protecting from the elements and all the rest of it. A hunter-gatherer is not looking to, to space and thinking about immortality and traveling to the stars and becoming a god, right? Something happened to cause that switch to go off. Now, maybe it was like Jaynes did in his bicameral mind. Maybe it's a left brain, right brain thing. And we were all schizophrenic yeah. until recently. And then we're becoming schizophrenic again. Um, maybe it's something like that, you know. But that does not that's a way of talking about it. But it doesn't really prove anything. It's not real evidence. It's just a way, like, like a Jungian approach to psychology, right? Like it's metaphor, it's mythology and stuff, way of trying to understand, get a, a handle on something. But I've always thought, and I've thought for a long time, that there was something to this idea that something came from somewhere else. And it was this, this moment of contact, which was an explosion in, in human consciousness. It just opened us up constantly, suddenly. And we were no longer just part of the, the mammal system on the planet. We were something else suddenly. We became some a different kind of being because of that. Um, you know, in the introduction to... Um, to the very first book, The Secret Machines, Gods, there was that that, that introduction on the, the cargo cults. Mm -hmm. um, that was the first page, of, the first pages we wrote on this whole thing was that introduction, the cargo cult thing. It was a, it was a document of, I think, about 20 pages type, type written. Um, that was the first thing that I created on this for this project. I sent it to Tom without realizing that Tom would use that as like our mission statement, you know, right, right. He started giving that to everybody, right? He started sending it to this one and that one and his contacts and his his you know his advisors and everything else. They were all getting copies of this thing. I'm thinking, oh God, it was I didn't realize. If I had known, you know, I might have prettied it up a little bit or something. But it got the attention that we needed. Suddenly, people started taking us seriously. They read that introduction and they said, "Okay, you're on the right track. This is these are people we can talk to." Because you're approaching this thing with the perfect blend, I guess is what their, their intention was, the perfect blend of this idea of ancient you know, religions and ancient cultures and a modern scientific approach to it. The cargo cult, I think, gave us the, the hook that we needed. And what, the more I thought about it, the more I, I wrote about it, the more I researched it, because I had studied it in, in school. I mean, the cargo sure. cult. Sure, yeah. In religious studies, it's something that you come across. And I had seen, when I was a kid, a teenager, a movie had come out called Mondo Cane. Don't know if you remember this movie. No. no. It was a weird Italian documentary, one of those weird shock docs. It was like one of the first ones that they came out with. And it was, it was in Italian, it was dubbed back in English and everything. But there was this long section towards the end about the cargo cult. It was actually filmed a cargo cult. And that stuck in the back of my mind for decades. And then suddenly I realized that a cargo cult basically... What happened was it was in the, the South Pacific. It was in the early 20th century, just before World War II. And Stone Age, what we would call Stone Age pre-literate peoples living on the islands in the South Pacific in near um, Papua New Guinea in that part of the world. 
they suddenly see airplane, an airplane coming down. Someone had built a landing strip and a plane is coming down and there's cargo coming out. It's medicines, it's ammunition. The beginning of the war is starting, right? So you have the Japanese doing this, you have the British doing this, you have people you know, carving out landing strips in the jungle. And people who had never even seen a wheel, right, are now looking at an aircraft landing. And the aircraft opens up and there's cargo coming out, all these boxes of goodies. And there are all these strange people dressed in uniforms and they're speaking a language that's unintelligible and they look different and they're not us, right? And they're doing all this. And these people thought, my goodness, this is so weird. Let's build an landing strip ourselves. And maybe these, these things will come down and give us cargo too. Well, they started doing that and they're still waiting, right? Yeah, they're right. Still waiting for those planes to land. But it created a religion. It created an entire religion. And when I look back on what we were starting to do with the, with the project for Secret Machines, it suddenly dawned on me that our entire human civilization is a cargo cult. We want immortality and we want to travel to the stars. And all of our science and all of our politics and all of our wars and all of our religions are all manifestations of these twin desires of immortality and star travel. The pyramids, you know, the ancient Sumer, I mean, the Aztecs going to China and going to Australia, everybody is talking about star travel and somehow linking that with immortality. And now you have our, you know, our, our billionaires doing the same thing. They're building spaceships and they're also trying to figure out how they can live forever, right? Um, which is all we need, Elon Musk immortal. Um, yeah. but, you know, this is, but this is this has been motivating us since the very beginning. We're motivated by these two things, our, sci our medical science Healing disease, living longer, living longer, living longer. The Egyptian pharaohs were mummified, so the bodies would stay intact and they would find their way up to the stars. They would occupy stars in the solars, in the in the in, in the firmament. Um, all of these ideas that we're going to be immortal, we're going to live on the stars. That to me came from somewhere. I could be completely wrong. I'm speculating naturally, but it does give us an explanation as to what we're doing. If we are all a cargo cult then it was instigated by something. Something gave us this idea, this concept, travel to the stars, be immortal. And I think this is part of what um, the secret machines thing was, 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 it was our, our perspective. It got a lot of attention from people. They looked at this and they said, that's one way of looking at human civilization. We're, we're a cargo. Uh, wonderfully said. Um, well, look, it's, um, it looks like we're running out of time here. So we're going to have to wrap up this particular session of TTS talks. Uh, we will be back with episode 10 of TTS Talks with Peter Lavenda and chatting about um, the second uh, book and maybe a little bit more of the first. I have a few more questions I really want to ask you, uh, uh, man, uh, and uh, we'll be doing that very soon. Peter, again, thank you very, very much for spending time with us today, and we will chat with you again soon. All of the Secret Machines books are available at uh, tothestars.media. You can stay up to date with TTS by finding us on social media. Instagram at to the stars dot media, Twitter at to the stars dot media, and Facebook at to the stars Inc. Peter, where can uh, listeners find you? Pretty much all of the above: Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thanks to Tom and his team who forced me onto social media, and now I've been fighting it every day <laughs> since then. Uh, I'm not that active on it, as everybody knows who's been following me. I apologize for that. But uh, I am active on it to a certain extent, and uh, I'll be promoting this show and talking more about it also on social media. So you'll find me on Facebook and, and Twitter and Instagram as well. Fantastic. I'm, I'm looking to chat with you in the future for uh, two more episodes on this. We have a lot of things to go through. And again, thanks uh, to all the listeners for tuning in to TTS Talks. If you would like, if you like what you heard, please subscribe to the podcast, rate and review us over at Apple Podcast, and we will catch you next time for part uh, two of this three-part series discussing secret machines, gods, man, and war. Have a great day.